Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Friends of the South Grey Museum, I welcome you to the fifth event in their speaker series. My name's Jeff Bowes, and I'm filling in for our friend Terry Mockery this evening while Terry paces back and forth at the Terminal 1 arrivals level, waiting for his son to appear through the international doors on his return from Thailand. Now, we here are meeting on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, the people of the three first, known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. We thank them. And we acknowledge the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. And we recognize the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. And how about these Annesley volunteers, looking elegant, helping us to our seats, serving fair trade coffee from island grounds? And the stage crew have created a beautiful harvest setting for us to enjoy this evening, don't you think? Thanks, crew. Now, did you know that today only 16% of pilots are women? One of those 16 percenters is our guest tonight, pilot, flight instructor, and teacher, Marilyn Dixon. Or should I say Dr. Marilyn Dixon? Oh yes, her PhD dissertation was on women teachers moving into leadership roles with the title, Slipping the Bonds. That's a flying metaphor, familiar to some from the John McGee Jr. poem, High Flight. The first line being, oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth. I think that line speaks to the unique sense of freedom and exhilaration that lures women like Marilyn to the skies. She first learned to fly in 1988 and she didn't stop learning. She trained for a commercial license as well as for multi-engine and instrument ratings. She can even slip the surly bonds in a seaplane. Her 30-year flying career, is now 35 years, has included co-piloting a Piper Navajo on charter flights, but later she went on to get her rating as an instructor, instructing private students and commercial students as well as teenagers at a summer camp, something she was telling me she thoroughly enjoyed. And Ms. Dixon shares her passion for aviation and its history with the 99s. That's an international organization of women pilots established in 1929 by 99 female pilots and founded by, among others, Amelia Earhart. This organization has been going strong for nearly 100 years, and Ms. Dixon has been an active participant and committee member of the Canadian 99s. Besides flying and teaching, Ms. Dixon is also an accomplished writer and researcher. She writes and gives presentations for the 99s, as well as for Canadian women in aviation and other publications, like my favorite, in Canadian History Magazine, where she wrote an account of Eileen Volokh, the first woman to get her pilot's license in Canada. The piece is entitled, Unacquainted with Fear. That's a state of mind that appears to resonate with our guest, as well as with so many female pilots. One of Marilyn's favorite projects was the Stamp Project, initiated by the East Canada section of the 99s. Each year, for the past 15 years, they have produced a commemorative stamp honoring a Canadian woman pilot. They are a collection of, they're, they're bold, they're heroic looking stamps. And they're popular an item with stamp collectors who are buying them all online. However, one of these stamps is sold out. The stamp honoring Vi Milstead or as Marilyn calls her, the intrepid Vi Milstead. Marilyn and Vi were friends, good friends. Marilyn received a, search, a research scholarship to work on the biography of her friend. And so now, here, the life and times of the intrepid Vi Milstead will be shared with us by an equally intrepid woman, 
Please welcome our guest tonight from Durham, Ontario, Marilyn Dixon. Thanks, Jeff, for that uh, fulsome introduction. I think you've probably heard just about all I have to say, so uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. This is a, a very special night for many of us. It's the 94th anniversary of when women were declared persons in Canada and were thus eligible to represent us in the government and in the Senate. I happen to have a t-shirt acknowledging that. <clears throat> Agnes McPhail was the first uh, female M member of parliament in, in Canada and she grew up not far from here so it's always special to me when I hear of somebody in Gray County that uh, has done something really noteworthy. Um, so it's uh, very special to me that I was invited to uh, speak this evening. I happened to get the uh, t-shirt, by the way, from Jane, who is uh, one of the hosts for the program tonight. So I met her years ago when she was selling t-shirts. I, I try to dress for the occasion, and this was an example, but I have another example too. This also links to my talk tonight because that it's indirectly about the same time as I was involved in another project that I, I met uh, Vi. I was the governor for the uh, East Canada section of the 99s in, in the year 2000, which happened to be the 50th anniversary of the 99s in Canada. And we wanted to have some special occasions, special events to celebrate. So the first one was to um, invite, uh, have a dinner, a really nice dinner for women pilots who we usually see in their jeans and, and uh, sweatshirts or whatever because they've flown into the meeting. But in planning uh, for a speaker, I knew that Jane, June Colwood uh, had recently before that had been taking gliding lessons. So I called her and, and asked her and if she would like to speak at our celebration. And uh, she said, well, you know, it would be really nice if my instructor could come. So I knew that she had taken her uh, earlier flight training soon after the Second World War. So I was envisioning some big burly uh, Air, Air Force pilot who had become her instructor. And I was trying to find a way to gently say to her, well, no, it's you that we want, June. But uh, anyway, she persisted and finally I said, well, who was your instructor? And of course it was Vi Milstead. And um, when, uh, when I heard that, that made all the difference. I didn't know very much about Vi at the time and uh, was certainly looking forward to hearing her then at our dinner. The other thing we planned that year in 2000 was to have a, a flying rally for women pilots. They didn't have to be our members. They could be, you know, any women as long as they flew. And uh, so we planned a, uh, a rally and one of the things we wanted to do was to make women pilots more visible. Hence, several of us got flight suits and uh, carted them up with badges every year and so on. So um, 
If you, if you want to check, I've got a, a badge from every year since then, except the one year that we didn't fly. I had originally intended this to be a one-year event, but when I ordered the cup uh, for the prize, I wasn't very specific. And the man who uh, made it put 18 plaques on it, so it became an annual event. Anyway, uh, at the dinner, Vi was... Um, she was a very quiet woman, didn't talk much. And June, of course, was um, a very good interviewer. So we set it up so June would talk about her flying and then she would interview Vi about hers. She knew Vi a lot better than I did at that point. So I can remember during the presentation, at some point, uh, she asked Vi what it was like to fly in the bush because Vi had been Canada's first woman bush pilot. And Vi said, well, you fly in the bush. <laughs> and that's all she said. That should have been my first clue that she wasn't very loquacious, but uh, Anyway, uh, after the event, Vi really turned out to be a, a very good, uh, entertaining speaker that night, too. And after that, uh, she wrote me a nice note and said, if you're ever down my way, come for a cup of tea. So I decided this is one cup of tea I'm going to enjoy. So a few weeks after that, I was in her area and, uh, and called and asked if the kettle was on. And that was really the beginning of what became a, a wonderful friendship. Um, as we got to know each other better, she would answer pretty well any question I asked her. But then she'd ask me the same question, so I'd have to be prepared. If I didn't want to talk about something, I wouldn't be asking her. Anyway, it wasn't very long before I decided that I, I really would like to, to not just come for tea, but to uh, work on her biography, because she really was quite a remarkable young woman um, in her early days and, and then in her later days too, as I could see the, um, the ongoing learning that she was doing and, and how she was, um, she continued to be interested in, in life. And so I, I made the pitch that I'd, I'd like to write her biography, and she readily agreed. So, of course, the first thing she did was to pass me copies of what other people had written about her. And it had not been very much at that time. Um, some, some of uh, her husband had, had done some writing and uh, a couple of other people, that, but not very much. So anyway, we, we became good friends as, as we proceeded through this exercise. So I'm going to start uh, by telling you a little about, a bit about her early days. And at that time, um, she wasn't... Uh, she didn't ever say very much about her, her time at school, except she said enough for me to know that she must have been a very good student. She was uh, starting grade nine at age 12, um, and she had aspirations to be a doctor. And as she was going through elementary school and then on into high school. Um, she was born in 1919. So now we're getting into the depression in, in her uh, high school days. Her father, who was uh, in construction, was not able to find work at that time. Her mother uh, worked for someone else in a wool shop. And um, her father, uh, basically did the housework. She told me one time about him doing the laundry and, you know, with one of those old-fashioned washing machines and so on. And um, anyway, he, he was pretty much the, the house husband in the 30s. 
About the mid-30s, the shop that uh, her mother worked in uh, closed. So there went her mother's job. But her parents decided they would buy a wool shop business in downtown Toronto. Well, it's downtown now, it wasn't then. Um, but uh, that would mean that they would live then in the, in the apartment above the wool shop. So they'd been living out uh, northwest of Toronto in kind of a, a shell of a house. And Vi's father, whenever he wasn't doing laundry and other things, um, would work on uh, building the rooms within the house. But when they bought the wool shop business, they had to move. And that meant that Vi would have to go to a different school. She was not pleased about that. By that time, she was 15 in what would have been grade 11. And uh, they, they moved in May. So she wasn't even able to write her final exams. So as far as her education record went, she had a grade 10 education. When they moved, um, her, her mother was working in the wool shop and Vi was having to do the housework and prepare the meals and that sort of thing. And that kept her busier than she wanted to be with that kind of an activity. Um, she told me that even their dog ran back to the first house after they'd moved twice. And the third time they decided they'd leave it with the, um, the neighbors that were more interested in having the dog. So this was a, an awful time for Vi. She was quite depressed, I would say, um, as she was just going through a very dreary looking life. And her, her plans of being a doctor were, had totally disappeared. Before long, the wool shop got busier, and she started going down and, and helping out. And she met a, one of the salesmen who was learning to fly. And about the same time, her brother took her to the sportsman's show to try and cheer her up one day. And she met Pat Patterson, who ran a flying school at Barker Field. So. Pat, when he saw her coming, just asked her, uh, as a matter of course, are you interested in learning to fly? Well, was she ever, though she didn't know much about it at that time. Um, and that was soon after they had moved to the wool shop in 1935. <clears throat> so before long then, uh, she decided uh, that she, she would go to ground school. Central Tech was, was offering a ground school and, and she went there when she was 16 and, and learned all she could about flying with all the fellows that were in the class. But she didn't have enough money to learn to fly. She didn't have enough money for, for flying lessons. About that time, her mother was getting busier in the shop and she decided to hire Vi to um, to work in the shop as well, and uh, so Vi started saving all of her money uh, until she had enough to, uh, to pay for flying lessons. Finally, in 1939, she had enough money, not only to, to learn to fly, but she had to buy a car as well and learn how to drive so she could get to the airport. So by then she had enough money to get her private license, so off she went to, uh, to uh, learn to, to fly. While she was doing that, her instructor, Pat Patterson, was a real entrepreneur. And this was just the beginning of the war in Britain. And in looking ahead, he was wondering how many people might not be interested in flying anymore especially the fellows who could join the Air Force and uh, they wouldn't have to pay to learn to fly. So he made a film about Vi while she was learning 
and uh, had her go and uh, they filmed several of her lessons. I have never found that film, I'd love to, but as we talked about it and as I looked at her logbook, I could pretty well figure out what, um, you know, the order of, of what would be in the film as he, he was having uh, this film made. Anyway, she, uh, about that same time, just as the film was finished and Vi got her license, her private license, at the end of December in 1939, her mother decided she was going to sell the wool shop. So there went Vi's source of income. Her father, in the meantime, the economy was picking up with the war and her father was easily able to get a job. So, but Vi's job was gone. So she then bought a wool shop business with some of the remaining savings she had. And uh, with that wool shop then, she was able to make enough money to get her commercial license, which she did in, in April, uh, just about four months after that. That is much faster than most current students take to get their, their um, private and, and commercial licenses. But she was a keen learner. Once she had her commercial license, she still operated the wool shop. She had a, a partner, she had taken on a partner. And um, Irene then would, uh, would be in the wool shop a good part of the time and, and Vi could be flying. With a commercial license, that allows you to start being paid as a pilot. I used to tell my students that uh, when you have a private license, that's when you can take up your unsuspecting, uh, trusting friends and family because you've just learned to fly. But once you have a commercial license, people are going to pay you for your knowledge and, and your skills, so you better be good and safe. So. Pat Patterson uh, hired Vi then to do introductory flights to um, people on the weekends and, and evenings and whenever. But Vi wasn't making much money doing that and she still had the wool shop. Anyway, Pat came along one day and, and said, if you would get your instructor rating, I'll pay for it if you'll come and, and work for me. So. They, they made that deal, and uh, by July of uh, that year then, they, she had her instructor rating. And I've, I've met a couple of her instructors, um, uh, sorry, of her students, and uh, they tell me that everybody was a bit in love with Vi. She was quite a delightful woman, and, and she had many male students who wanted to learn enough flying that when they joined the Air Force, they could become pilots. So they had to at least show that they could, uh, could solo. So she had quite a few students during that time. And she also had some, some female students that were still interested in, in learning to fly. If we think about the times though that, that she was learning to fly, in Canada, in, in other countries, women were flying a bit. We've all heard about Amelia Earhart, who learned to fly. She had a female instructor who, when she, when her instructor, uh, Netta Snook, was learning to fly, part of their training as a group was to put the airplane together and then to get in it and fly it. <laughs> Um, so in the early days, you know, aviation was very primitive, but there were women in other countries that were uh, learning to fly in the early days. Jean Batten in, in New Zealand, for example, uh, Beryl Markham in, in South Africa. So there were, were women in the 20s that were learning to fly. Vi didn't have her first lessons till 1939. In Canada, the first woman to get her license to fly, to learn to fly, didn't get it until 1928. And it was partly because after the First World War, the men who had learned to fly kept flying and they were doing, in, in the Air Force, 
it wasn't called the Royal Canadian Air Force at that time, but they were in a group called the Air Force. And they did things like mapping northern Canada, uh, firefighter spotting, um, doing some, some bush pilot type of, of operations through the, their Air Force. And so there was no need even for flying schools. And so the men were doing that kind of work, more civilian type work. It wasn't until 1926 that the Royal Canadian Air Force was formed and then they um, had more specific uh, details, more specific work for the Air Force pilots and it didn't include some of this other civilian flying. <clears throat> So there was a young woman born in Wyerton, not far from here. Eileen, she was originally Eileen Riley, and uh, she was she lived there in her early days. Her father was killed in a mining accident, actually before she was born, and her mother remarried uh, Mr. Volick, and they moved to Hamilton. When Eileen was there at 18 years of age, she was driving to her job, and she watched them building the first uh, school where, where flying would be taught. Finally, she bolstered up her, her courage and went in one day and said, can a girl learn to fly? Well, the fellow who ran the school didn't know. They had to write to the government to get permission for a girl to learn to fly. Finally, four months later, the letter came back that, yes, a girl could learn to fly, but she had to do a few more things than the, than the males that were learning at that time. Anyway, she got her flying license, and she was another very courageous young woman. She jumped from, a, from the plane just to show that she had courage. And when her younger sister watched she was telling me that the, the parachute came down all around her and Eileen was trying to swim away from that and the mother was quite worried. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But there was one, she was the first Canadian woman to get a pilot's license. In the 30s, there was a group of women in the uh, Western Canada um, that called themselves the Flying Seven and they did things to uh, draw attention to themselves as women pilots too, uh, such as having a dawn to dusk flight, in which case one would take off and as soon as she landed, the next one would go up and, and so on. And they had uniforms that they wore to their meetings and again to, to draw attention to themselves. Uh, Jessica Jarvis was a well-known Toronto socialite who got her commercial license in the, about 1934. And she quit flying because she knew she'd never get a job. So, you know, that was kind of the scene that, that Violet had been, had been working in. Anyway, she's going along instructing. And in the, in the fall of 1942, uh, the government uh, put a ban on all aviation fuel, avgas as we call it. It could no longer be used for civilian flying. It all had to be used for military purposes. So there went Vi's job. And uh, you know, th this was in October of 1942. She described to me taking gas from one plane and putting it in another one so they could get enough gas in, in one plane that so-and-so could have a flight. And at that time, the wool shop wasn't doing all that well either, so here she was un unemployed yet again. When somebody told her about the Air Transport Auxiliary in England, and it, it was a civilian organization that its main purpose was to do flying that could be done um, 
by, well, by other than the Air Force. And the pilots that were used to do this flying were the men who were too old to be in the Air Force, some who had been injured in the First World, World War. Uh, there was one man that had uh, no right arm. He'd, he'd had it amputated after that. He wanted to uh, do the test for the, for the pilots, and at first they said no. And then he insisted and demonstrated that he could fly as well as anybody else. So men that had handicaps of that sort of thing or vision or were too old to be in the Air Force or women, those were the people that could join the, the Air Transport Auxiliary. At first, it, when they were first formed, it was only for men. 28 men joined the ATA. But there was a very um, persuasive young woman uh, pilot in England who had been running her own flying business for a few years before that. And she got permission to have eight women join the, the ATA, eight to begin with, in uh, February of 1940, just not that long after the war began. And uh, of course, they were mostly British women who had been flying in races and had learned to fly and were doing all kinds of interesting flying, like flying to Paris for lunch and, and that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, they, they joined the uh, Air Transport Auxiliary. Now, the purpose of the ATA was to, initially, it was to just deliver mail and people that needed um, Im important people that needed to be flown someplace. But before long, they found that maybe they could do more than that. And in the end, after they got started on their program, they were delivering military airplanes from the factories to the military bases or to the bases, the maintenance units, where they got the radios and the bombing equipment put in the planes. So these were civilian pilots, like, just like me, and who, uh, you know, got uh, hired to do this kind of delivery. They had 147 different types of airplanes that they could be asked to fly. Now, if you think about that, if you've had a smart car that you learned to fly or learn to drive, and then somebody comes along and says, "Well, I'd like you to to take this Lincoln limousine someplace, and I'd like you to, you know, take this transport someplace and deliver it," that was just about the kind of thing that was being expected of them. They had a little book that was about the size of a four by six recipe card. And on that card, they had the details of a type of airplane. The, this one it happens to be uh, for a Spitfire. If you look carefully, if you can read that fine print, there were 24 different types of Spitfires, some with one type of engine, others with other types of engines. Even if they have the same type of engine because of the, their shape and, and so on, they might have a different stall speed of, of 20 miles an hour. Like it, it could uh, stall at uh, you know, 68 knots and then the other one at 88 knots. For pilots, knowing the stall speed is very important. That's the speed at which the airplane won't fly on its own, and you have to do something to keep it in the air. So they had this book, and people talk about, you know, they have this little book that has this information about all these airplanes. Well, first of all, it doesn't have information about all the airplanes. It only has information about 80 of them. 
and the rest you have to kind of figure out for yourself as you're getting into the airplane. But the airplanes were divided into different uh, degrees of difficulty. Class one airplanes, for example, were like the ones that you would, single engine that you would use for training. Class two were the fast single air, uh, engine airplanes. Class three were twin engine, but fairly common and easy to fly. Class four were the, the big complex twin bombers. Class five were the four engine bombers. And class six were the, the planes that would, you would fly uh, on water as well, bombers that you would fly on water. So anyway, when Vi got there, she traveled over in 1942, sorry, 1943, in April of 43, in a ship, um, mostly with uh, other service people that were going over. And uh, so that trip took about 12 days. When she, and she got there by mid-April. It was July before she first set foot in an airplane because she had a lot of ground training first. So people see this little book and are amazed that they can, uh, these pilots can fly from that. But they had very extensive training every time they moved from one class to the next, to the next, and so on. And some pilots didn't ever get beyond, you know, the very, fairly basic single engine planes. Um, anyway, they, uh, they went through that training and uh, it was quite, uh, quite extensive training. And as they completed something, then they would get a promotion and they start as a cadet, then they're a third officer second officer, first officer, and so on. When I started, uh, when I first met Vi, I had heard about uh, four Canadian-born women that had joined the Air Transport Auxiliary, and then there were about 35 men. Um, since I started working on this project, I've identified 10 Canadian-born women in total, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of them. Lois Butler, Lois Reed Knox Niven Butler, her name was. Somehow I got really interested in, in all the names they had because some of them had a few husbands. Um, Lois was uh, born in Montreal, but she, she grew up in Newfoundland uh, as part of the Reed family, and after the First World War, she was born in 1897. After the First World War, she, she married a man who had been uh, in the First War. They had a, a daughter, and within about three years, he died. And uh, she then later met a man who had been in the Second World War, uh, a Britisher, Alan Butler, who was considered to be one of the wealthiest commoners in Britain. So when they got married, he built a boat and they sailed it across to England. She got very involved in learning to fly then. He flew, but she hadn't, she hadn't, but she learned to fly. And she was very competitive. She, uh, they had a King's Cup race there regularly, and uh, Ellen used to fly in it, but once she learned to fly, she, she challenged him, and she flew in the uh, King's Cup as well. Neither of them won, but uh, they enjoyed the, the flying. She was also a skier. Uh, in 1936, she represented the Canadian women's ski team the first time they had a ski team in the Olympics in Germany. She was the captain of the team. And then uh, after that, she, she joined the ATA and served for from uh, early years until pretty much until the end of the war. 
The second woman to join, uh, her name was uh, Elsie Joy Muntz Davidson. She was born in Toronto, and her father died, and uh, her mother uh, and her two daughters moved back to England. And she was in England. She was 17 when Lindbergh made his flight across the uh, country, uh, across the Atlantic. And she was one of the 17-year-olds that was cheering him on when, when he arrived there. Um, after the, uh, the war, she, uh, sorry, not after the war, after meeting Lindbergh, she got very interested in flying. She learned to fly and started her own business and had been very, um, became very well known in, in Britain. And uh, there's a, there are a couple of portraits of her at the, in the portrait gallery in, in London, England. Because she had been flying, there's a, a picture of her, one of the pictures of her there. Um, because she was so experienced when she joined the ATA in, on July 1st, uh, 1940, she, um, they put her, they didn't have a lot of airplanes available to train with at that time in the ATA. There's her other picture in her airplane, her aviation outfit. They, um, because she had so much experience, they put her on a more complicated airplane than the other pilots uh, had. Most, all of the ATA pilots had extensive training and even no matter how many hours they had, they had to go back and, you know, start at the basics and, and carry on. And uh, it, so she wasn't in an open cockpit tiger moth. She was in this more complex, faster airplane. And within the first week, she was killed in an accident, she and her instructor. The uh, cause of the accident, they decided, was carbon monoxide poisoning. If she'd been in a, a slower, open cockpit plane, it wouldn't have been a problem. So she was the, the second Canadian-born woman to join. Helen Harrison was the next one, born in Vancouver. Her parents were both working one would be, well, the childcare wasn't ideal. I'll just put it that way. She was a bit of a hellion by the sound of things. And her parents moved back to England so that she could go to um, be in a boarding school and get some discipline. So while they were there, um, her mother's father died. And he had left his two grandchildren a substantial amount of money that they were to get when they got married. Well, I guess Helen found out about this. She got married at 17, got the inheritance, bought an airplane, took lessons, learned to fly in England. And then she followed her instructor to Singapore so she could get her float rating now, there are places a lot closer than Singapore to learn to fly a float plane, but anyway, she went off after him. On her way back, she stopped in South Africa. Um, oh, I, I, I should have mentioned her, her name because this intrigues me. I said Helen Harrison. Uh, she was born uh, Helen Testamales was her surname. She changed her name to Harrison. Her grandfather's name was Harrison, the one that left her the money. And that's the name she's been known by ever since, for the rest of her life. But when she was in South Africa, she had another marriage after the, the first one to uh, Mr. Barnes that got her, that allowed her then to get the money. Uh, in South Africa, she met somebody else. His name was DeWall. 
D-E-W-A-A-L. And uh, anyway, that marriage didn't last very long. Um, and she, she reverted again to Harrison. And you can see in the official documents, you know, how she's changing her name back to Harrison and so on. Anyway, in, in South Africa, she got a job um, teaching some of the basic planes that were used for basic uh, military instruction. So she came back to, her, to England, where she still had her plane. And uh, she was flying it. But then she started applying for jobs. She didn't get um, much, much of a job there. In the meantime, she'd, she'd had some children. She had four sons. And her parents kind of followed her and looked after the children while she was flying. She went to the US then and applied for jobs there, naming her military experience in South Africa based on these training airplanes. And she worked there briefly, and then she came back to Toronto. And she tried to get a group of women pilots in Toronto that would be learn to fly and would uh, then be available to join the military. She had written a few times to the Canadian officials because she was born in Canada and uh, tried to um, get, get uh, join the Air Force. Uh, that was her goal, was to join the Air Force. So after she'd been in the States for a while, she came back to Canada and in Toronto set up this, this class for uh, female students. There are pictures of it in some, a couple of the Toronto papers. And uh, anyway, they, and names in her logbook. But that didn't really go anywhere. And so in 1942, she joined the, the Air Transport Auxiliary and went to England and, and was quite a good pilot there. She was, she was very good at um, learning the different types of airplanes and, uh, and had quite a good, uh, she, she had a good time there. She, uh, on her leaves, she belonged to four clubs in London that she used to go on and frequent, but she also was a very good pilot. When she came back to Canada, um, she met another well-known uh, male pilot when she was driving a taxi. That was the only job she could get at that time. The next one uh, that I'll mention, uh, Gloria Large, came from Prince Edward Island. And she joined when she was quite young. She joined the Air Transport Auxiliary. If you've noticed any of the other uniform pictures, that's not an ATA regulation hat she's wearing but it's the one that was in the Charlton paper uh, as uh, her father announced that she, she was going to be flying these exotic airplanes. Um, she was just, I think, pretty immature for, for the job she was expected to do. And um, she didn't last very long with, with the Air Transport Auxiliary. She didn't get to the point where she was actually flying uh, the military planes. And there was a period of almost a year after the time she went over to join, and her father had put a big article in the Charlottetown paper about what she was going to be doing. We didn't hear so much afterwards. And there's kind of a several months of her history missing. But uh, she came back to Charlottetown uh, after that. Betty Lucier was the next one who also joined in 1942. She was born in Medicine Hat and then uh, to a, a farming, her father was a farmer at that time and they moved to the States and uh, where they farmed. But her father had been in the First World War, and he was a good buddy of um, William Stevenson, 
the, the one who was associated with spies. And uh, in fact, he was her godfather. So she joined the, the Air Transport Auxiliary, and when she went over in November of 1942, the male and female pilots were uh, paid differently. The, the women weren't paid as much as the, as the men. She didn't like that. She also didn't like the fact that some of the male ATA pilots by that time were allowed to fly to the continent, and the women weren't. So in, in uh, April of 1943, she quit and became a spy through her godfather, who convinced her parents that she would be much safer as a spy than flying in the ATA. So uh, that's how she finished the war. I, and I understand she was a quite successful. Her main role was to find spies from the other side and double them so they would fly, they would do work for our side. She was only 21 when she started that job. And uh, she had, had quite an interesting career after that. She married another, a, a man who had been, also been a spy. And they had uh, three sons, three or four. And um, they divorced a bit after that. And her next main project was to teach uh, some of the farmers in, I'm trying to think of the name of the country, at the north end of, of Africa. Um, uh, no, it, w it started with M. Morocco. Morocco, yeah, that was it. Anyway, she knew from her flying, from her farming experience, in her family that she knew how to, grew to grow corn. And so she was living in Morocco at, the point, at that point in, in an apartment building. She was back in New York on a shopping trip and bought enough seed corn for a thousand acres and bought a couple of tractors. But the only address she had in Morocco was in the apartment building. So she, she had to scamper back to, to Morocco before the things would be delivered so they'd, she could reroute the delivery. Anyway, she's written quite an interesting book about that. And uh, anyway, that's how she spent the rest of the war as a spy. Um, and then Vi Milstead was she joined next. She, she joined in April of uh, 1943. And she let uh, her good friend Marion Orr know about uh, the ATA. Um, they had both had Pat Patterson as instructors, and uh, Marion was looking for a, a job at that point, too. So the two of them went over together, and they had quite a, an interesting time with, Vi was very focused on learning to fly. At one point, six men took her out for her 25th birthday, but she wasn't really dating anybody while she was over there. Marion, on the other hand, met a fellow on the boat uh, on the way over that then came to visit her uh, after she got there. And Marion didn't, she, she stayed about 18 months with the ATA, and she had an awful time with navigation. And she's written about it in, in her journal. When you think about it, you know, these two women learned to fly just out of Toronto, small, slow airplanes, and they might fly to Hamilton, or one time the two of them uh, flew uh, to Windsor and back to, to pick up an airplane. And so they were flying planes that, that would uh, go about 70 or 80 miles an hour. And they were flying long distances. So when they were doing that, they had time to think about what they were doing and plan ahead. But the job with the ATA, the airports were close together and uh, they were flying fast airplanes. 
So they would just be up at altitude, which wasn't very high. They weren't allowed to fly very high. And then it would be time to get set up for landing. Like a Spitfire, which was uh, also a, a class one airplane, would cruise at about 130 knots compared with 70 or 80, the, the cub they might be flying at home. And, and the distances were so close together in, in England when they were trying to navigate. You know, the roads weren't going straight and mixed in with the roads were railway tracks. Sometimes you'd cross three or four railway tracks within a short distance. And if you miscounted, you, you could be way off. And Marion had quite a, a time with her, um, with her navigation. And so she, she came back uh, earlier than Vi did. The other, uh, one other woman, well, two of them I'll, I'll mention. Um, Elizabeth Russell was from Quebec. Her mother had been an invalid for her early days, and her father died when she was about 10. And she was, she was in a, a boarding school. And she, she heard about the air transport auxiliary and wanted to learn to fly so she could go and join them. Now, when she wanted to learn to fly by that time, aviation fuel in Canada couldn't be used for civilian training. So she made an arrangement with someone whose job was to test parachutes. And he would be flying up and, uh, you know, taking people up to, to test parachutes. He took Elsbeth along with him, and, with the, him and gave her lessons as they were doing this parachute testing. So that when she had her, her test to join the ATA, she could demonstrate that she could fly the, the Harvard that was the, the test plane. She did very well with that. And uh, so she joined the ATA then in the fall of uh, 1943 and, and stayed till the end of the war. The, the last woman I'm going to mention, Mary Frances Rudge Horsberg, had, had been part of the women's auxiliary in the Air Force. So their jobs were secretarial things and you know other kinds of things had nothing to do with flying. But on in the war, they were running out of pilots to fly with the ATA, and they were um, needing, needing to get some more volunteers. So they recruited a few non-pilots in 1944 and taught them to fly so they could then um, fly for the ATA, which she did. And the, the only other, the tenth woman I've identified, I haven't been able to find out very much about her. I'll just mention her name, though, Thelma Olga Leith Wall. So besides this, there were 35 Canadian men who joined the ATA, as well as people from many other countries. It was an incredible service to provide for the, um, for the war effort because it freed up a lot of Air Force pilots that would have had to do these deliveries otherwise. They did 309,011 that they've recorded during the time of the war. Now that's huge. There were 166 women in the ATA and about 800 men that did th this did this kind of flying. Anyway, for, ba for Vi, it was really the highlight of her life to be doing this kind of, of uh, flying. Um, when she came back close to the time the war ended, and uh, when she came back, her uh, mother said, well, you've had your fun. Now it's time to get a real job. And uh, so she tried, at first, she tried working um, downtown in secretarial work. 
that only lasted a couple of weeks before she was back to Barker Field and uh, um, learning to, well, it, teaching people to fly again. And that's also where she met the, the man that she was to la marry later on. So, and it was during that time that she taught June Colwood to fly. And uh, June, by that time, had, uh, had her first child. And uh, at that time, she, she said, you didn't hire a babysitter to go flying. So she'd take her, her daughter, Jill, to the uh, airport. Well, she'd have a lesson and leave Jill with, with Vi's uh, future husband, Arnold, um, to look after the baby. Well, well, June was having her, uh, her lesson. <clears throat> Arnold was pretty good at that. He already had three daughters. So it, uh, it worked fairly well. Shortly after that, they went to Nickel Belt Airways in Sudbury. And that's where Vi became the first Canadian woman bush pilot uh, flying uh, for Nickel Belt Airways. The job there involved fire, uh, not so much fire spotting, although if they saw fires, they certainly reported them, but they often had to, f to um, fly people out into the bush to fight the fires, and they often got these men in the pubs, so they'd, the men might have been there all afternoon, and they're, and they're suddenly held off to go and, and fight fires. And uh, Vi talked of one, one fellow who, when she got to the, uh, the site of the fire, landed in the lake, he didn't want to get out of the plane. Now, Vi was about five foot two at her tallest, and very slight. Anyway, she said, I helped him out with the toe of my boot. So, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes they, they would be flying miners out or, uh, or hunters, um, people out to construction sites to, uh, to do some work out there. And they, she came back one time in, in very poor weather. And when she got back home, Arnold said, I can't believe that you got over that bridge somewhere along the way. She said, I didn't, I flew under it. So. And another time she talked about uh, flying a, a prospector out with his groceries and the weather closed in so she had to stay over uh, overnight with him in his cabin without much heat. So sometimes that job wasn't uh, as glamorous as, as people uh, make it out to be. Anyway, after that time, uh, she still flew for a bit, but um, for example, she and Arnold were offered a, a job with the Windsor Flying Club, and uh, their job there was to um, reactivate the club. Well, the people that hired them were more interested in the so social aspect of it than the, uh, than the flying. Another job that, that Arnold um, was offered was in Indonesia to go and uh, be the chief flight instructor there. And uh, the school was, they didn't have enough instructors. Vi was a very qualified uh, instructor, but the boss wouldn't let Arnold hire her. He said, I'd, I'd be happy to meet your wife on the dance floor, but not, not instructing. So, you know, that was pretty much the end of their flying. Um, after that, she came back. She did work for Renda as they were uh, working on the Arrow. She worked in the library there. And uh, as they were, were back here after that, they both had their flying careers and, and really had to uh, think about looking ahead and so on. I'd like to just move ahead, Tim, to the, um, oh, let's look at the house, the front of the house. They settled in Colburn and also had um, property in the Magdalen Islands, and they uh, flew back and forth 
there they they kept they had their own plane then and did some flying. This is the the house that they built on the shore of Lake Ontario um, in 19, about 1995-96. You'll notice the solar panels. Um, they weren't there at the at first. They just built this beautiful small log house on the lake, where Vi could always look out at the lake and see the horizon. After Arnold died, um, she had the solar panels and the wind generator. You can see it just in the background. No, I think that's that's not. I don't think the the wind generator. Or, oh, yeah, right, okay. After Arnold died, um, Vi was, had uh, her own ideas about uh, how she wanted to do things. And she, was, she put that in in about 2001, uh, so he had already died. And uh, she called the man, that, the contractor, to put them in, uh, saying that she wanted solar panels and, and a wind generator. And he was very ethical, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it for you. You're, you're already in your 80s. People will think I'm taking advantage of you, so I don't want to do it. And she just replied, get your ass over here. And uh, he came over on his motorcycle then, and uh, they talked, and, and he made the installation. Later on, he took her for a ride on his motorcycle, too. Um, she, she was just very committed to, she wanted to, she knew she wouldn't make, get her money back out of the investment, but she wanted to set an example for people. And that's really the way she lived her life. Um, not only in the ATA when some of the other pilots were going off down to Le London on their time off and having a good time, she, she would stay back, uh, in her boarding house and, and help the, uh, uh, the landlady with things or whatever. She was there to fly. She wasn't there to, um, to meet, uh, meet a husband or anything. This picture is an example of when they were uh, flying in Sudbury. They weren't making much money as bush pilots and instructors, so they started a photography business and this is a, a portrait shot that uh, Arnold took of, of Vi, um, just to show what he was able to do. The best picture I've seen that he took was of Vi flying an airplane, and this was for a calendar shot. And she was flying down over the water. There was about this much space between the pontoons and the water. She wasn't landing. She was just flying at low so he could get a good picture. And uh, so they, they really, they worked together as a team. When they built a house, they dug a well together with one of them down in the hole, the other one pulling up the pail of, of soil and, and things. They took turns being down and up. Um, and they, when they didn't hit water in the first hole, they started another one and they hit water then. So she was just very persistent and uh, just a wonderful role model for a lot of us. I think I'll just stop almost there, except to say that when she died in 2014, my airplane partner, who is here t tonight too, uh, she and I scattered Vi's ashes over her house. And as we did that, we recited the poem, High Flight. Where 
never lark nor ever evil sleep. And while with silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space. Put out my hand. Thank you, Vi. I hope you all heard that. This was the microphone that I, that didn't work. I'll, I'll take the blame though, Tim. I'm sorry about that. Now, where were we? Oh, now it works. Oh. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, Marilyn, thank you so much. Um, I understand there are some 99ers in the audience. Are they uh, comfortable to stand up and be identified? Or at least put up your hand. I know who you are over there. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Welcome. <laughs> and thank you. That was wonderful, Marilyn. Extraordinary stories. And a life well lived by Vi. And yourself, I might add. Now. The Friends of the South Grey Museum have called upon a local hero to live stream this entire speaker series. So, hello out there in streamland. Um, the technical aspects of all this streaming are way over all of our heads. And thankfully, we have a technical wizard, Tim Riley. He's up there in the corner of the balcony. He controls the microphones and the screens and the streams. He's usually wearing headphones, so we have to clap a little louder for Tim. Thank you, Tim. Now we have uh, two door prizes to give away, so if that titan of treasurers, Steve Plenner, would make his way to the stage, he will draw the names of two lucky audience members who will be going home tonight with these books. Come on, stir. Give him a stir. The first one is 433594. Shall I read that again? 433594. Let's try another one, Steve. Okay. Four, three, three, five, seven, eight. Oh, we have a winner. <laughs> and you have a choice of Canadian women in the sky or daring lady flyers. Oh, sorry. No, no, my fault. Thank you. There. Which one strikes your fancy? This one. Canadian women in the sky. <laughs> okay, the next one, four, three, three, five, seven, five. Four, three, three, five, seven, five. Going once, twice. Let's go again, Steve. Four, three, three, five, seven, two. Oh, yes, this is perfect. Congratulations. Uh, this is about daring lady flyers. You already are one. Do you, did you want, oh, okay, sure, take it. That's fine. Good, well, congratulations. Welcome, thanks for being here. All right, now, the Friends of the South Gray Museum. They got a great deal of community support and Considering what they brought to our community, why wouldn't they? That being said, they remain grateful to their community partners and their supporters, Ansley Church, Stevens Restaurant, the Municipality of Grey Highlands, everybody at Ansley Events, and Highland Grounds for their stellar coffee, which is still available right through those doors there. Now, there's one more event in this speaker series. And it's the very engaging Richard Thomas who will be here to speak about booze and bars and temperance in Owen Sound. This program is packed with illustrations and it's based on 
a really fascinating book of Steve's, Saints and Sinners. That's also really funny. So save the date, November 16th, and we hope to see you again. So on behalf of Jane Gibson, Barry Penhale, friends of the South Gray Museum, oh, and the members of the museum board, there are a lot of them here. Would you raise your hands or stand up? Don't be shy, you museum board members. Peter, I see, come on, get up, come on. Don't be shy, two of you. Thank you so much. And to the rest of you, thank you all for coming. I wish you a good night and a safe home. <laughs> Marilyn is here to answer any questions you have. Step forward. I, I think I should mention that Marilyn was uncomfortable reading High Flight because uh, it's still quite moving for her that they uh, recited it at the, uh, shall I say, the ash uh, sure. drop of her friend. I guess it was an ash drop, wasn't it? You did it from a plane. Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions for Marilyn? Are there any other questions for the 99ers who are here with us tonight? Oh, I see a question back. Uh, did, Come on. did the women ever encounter uh, hostile aircraft when they were up flying? Well, there's one story that I've heard from more than one woman ATA pilot, as in several, where they talked about a German plane flying up beside them, and they took off their hat and shook out their curls, and the plane flew away. But I've, you know, it's a sort of a, a, a story that I think several of them thought sounded good. So I don't know how many times it happened. Maybe it did happen many times. You never know. The, the fighter planes were generally higher. The ATA pilots, because they were flying short distances, they didn't go very high. Uh, they were to have, be able to have at least 800 uh, feet, uh, you know, above the ground, um, but not fly much higher than that sometimes. And the fighters were higher, and then the bombers were even higher. One f plane that the Vi flew and they didn't end up using it in combat was a Welkin. And it was intended to be a, a high altitude, heavy bomber. Uh, like, and, and to fly that, they had to have oxygen. They were, they were up that high. So there wouldn't be, uh, but the, way, the reason they built it was because the British thought that there would be a chance that the Germans might be doing that at some point. So they built the airplane, and then they didn't ever use it in combat. combat. There were a few planes like that that got built. I'm really glad you asked that, because many people think they did, but no, they did not. Um, there was another group that flew planes f that were built in Canada and the U.S., flew them across the Atlantic um, into um, Scotland, and then the ATA pilots picked them up there and flew them within Britain. Um, there were a few women who got rides back in those planes after they were coming back from leave. And I talked to one of them, uh, a woman in California who had showed up in a, in a logbook as, and because they weren't allowed to fly civilians, they, uh, they called them the co-pilot. But Nancy told me that she had been riding in the back bomb turret. 
quite a piece from the cockpit, but she was the co-pilot in that flight. And a couple of the Canadian women have been named as co-pilots, but, and one of them even has quite a tale about how she became the co-pilot. But some were really good storytellers. Vi was not. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about a couple of other Canadian-born women, but um, when I met her, you know, I, I didn't know who she was and hadn't, hadn't heard very much about her. So when I met her, I thought it was important that more people did get to know about her. There were a couple of hands over here, too. Yeah. It's changing the subject somewhat. I can't put it into masculine or feminine. It's a question about the, the organization. Uh, was it in the beginning the RAF, and now it is the RCAF? No. In, are you talking about in Canada? Canada. In Canada. Right after the... Um, there wasn't an Air Force in Canada when the First World War started. The British came over and, and trained men to fly with them. And then at some point after that, they, they were the Air Force. They weren't the RCAF. Or they were the Canadian Air Force. Were they ever the RAF? The RAF was the British Air Force. Yes, they, they were incorporated, I think it was in 1926. I'm looking at Nat because she, uh, she's uh, really up on that. Thanks, Nat. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yes? Um, I recently read a book about um, this kind of subject where they went behind the lines and brought out the, the injured and the deceased. Now, was that just fiction or did that actually happen? Uh, what are you talking about after the Second World War? I haven't come across anything about that in my research. I, that's not to say it didn't happen. I just don't know. Jeff says it sounds like a novel, and he's probably right. Yeah, but everything um, fiction is based on fact. Maybe to a point, <laughs> but not always. Yes? Well, Vi flew a Dakota. I found it in her logbook. They, they flew quite a wide variety of airplanes. She flew 47 different types. And then if you think about the different types of Spitfires that she flew and different types of others, uh, it was 74 different um, variations on something that she flew, 
which is quite a wide range of, of experience. Just while I'm at the microphone, I'd like to say hi to uh, a 99 who I got a message from today from Greece. She's in, um, she's in Greece on a holiday and got the message that uh, was sent out from here about the speaker series. So, hi Val and Ron, I hope you're having a good time. And at this point, it's probably about 2.30 in the morning there. Any other questions? I think that's it. We should let you go, Mary. Thank you very much. Oh, this is Yes, indeed. Thanks, everybody.